Welcome back to another episode of Principles of Micro. Today we are still in Chapter 11, looking at price discrimination. So there are three kinds, and a kind we'll explore in this episode is called perfect price discrimination, or first degree price discrimination. Your book just calls it perfect price discrimination, but other books and articles might say first degree, so be sure you're familiar with both terms. They mean the same thing. So the way this works is that the firm charges each consumer their very maximum that they're willing to pay. So here's a simple example. We have three consumers, Samuel, Rachel, and Ethan. Let's say Samuel's going to pay at most $100 for this good. So we charge Samuel 100 Rachel's willing to pay up to 150 so we charge Rachel 150 The very most that Ethan would pay is 120 so we charge Ethan 120 So, not very hard. Now, this works out just fine if I know what each consumer's maximum is to pay is, but in reality, we don't know that. So, perfect price discrimination doesn't actually happen in the real world. There are some examples that come close, but it doesn't happen quite like that. So the best example that is close to per price discrimination is with college tuition. So as I said in the earlier episode, they give you different amounts of financial aid. And to get the financial aid, you have to tell them a lot of personal information about your family's finances. They ask you on multiple page forms about all sorts of stuff. So what they're trying to do there is they're trying to estimate what is the very most you're willing to pay to go to school. And then they'll offer you the bare minimum financial aid that they think you'll accept and still find it worthwhile to go to school. So because your preferences about what you want to pay are not going to be directly observed, they can't perfectly price discriminate. However, they gather so much information about you that they can come pretty close to doing this. So let's look at what this would imply for welfare. So first thing to know is that perfect price discrimination is going to reduce consumer surplus. So I brought this example back from an earlier chapter where we had consumer surplus being introduced to us for the first time. Keep things simple, I'll also have two consumers here, Samuel and Rachel. So our way back earlier, we talked about consumer surplus for the first time. We used WTP as an abbreviation for willingness to pay. So the very most you pay to get this good CS, of course, is consumer surplus. So, in our first table up here in our graph, we're looking at when there is no price discrimination. So, everyone's paying the same price of $1. So, Sam thinks this good is worth $4. We're going to pay up to $4 to get it. He only had to pay $1. That means his consumer surplus is going to be three dollars. So you see that over here in the graph. So Samuel's up here when to pay up to four. Remember what is the pay is going by a demand curve approximately. And what he actually pays down here, so that gap is Samuel's consumer surplus. The next part of the graph we have Rachel over here. She's going to pay two dollars for the good. So that curve is flat over here at two. She pays a price of $1. That means her consumer surplus is going to be 2 minus 1, which is 1. So the gap between what she's willing to pay up here and what she actually pays down here is her consumer surplus. So when there's no price discrimination, this L-shaped region here is all consumer surplus. So it's going to total... Four dollars. Three plus one is four. 
So that's the case without price discrimination. So now to illustrate my claim that price discrimination lowers consumer surplus, let's see what happens when the firm is going to perfectly price discrimination, price discriminate. So our first degree, first degree price discrimination means you charge each consumer their maximum ways to pay. Samuel's going to pay up to four dollars. That means you charge Samuel four dollars. So Samuel's paying the very most he thinks that the good is worth. So what's left over? Four minus four is zero. Now Rachel's going to pay two dollars for the good. The price is two dollars for her. We charge her her maximum list to pay. So she's also getting no consumer surplus. So consumer surplus went from four dollars when there was no price discrimination to zero dollars when there was perfect price discrimination. So that shows you that perfect price discrimination reduces, actually it can go further, actually perfect price discrimination eliminates consumer surplus. So now look at social welfare overall. Remember, social welfare is both consumer surplus and producer surplus. We established that consumer surplus goes down, but the fact what happens to social welfare, we also have to determine the effect on producer surplus. So compare us to the baseline case when there is no price discrimination. Now remember, a prerequisite here was that you have to have market power. That's the firm's the ability to set price. Whenever you have market power, the profit maximizing rule is marginal revenue equals marginal cost. So here in our first graph, the blue line is our demand curve. And remember, the marginal revenue curve is going to have the same intercept, but twice the slope. So this orange line is marginal revenue. Our green line here is marginal cost. So when there is no price discrimination, the firm sets marginal revenue equal to marginal cost. We pick out this quantity. We find the price by plotting that quantity on the demand curve. Because the price is going to be up here around $80 it looks like roughly. Maybe a little bit below 80 So here's what happens to social welfare when you set prices that way. So when the price is up here, then consumer surplus will be this purple triangle. So the demand curve tells you consumers willingness to pay the price you set is up here. So that's what the consumer actually pays. The gap between what you're willing to pay and what you actually pay is consumer surplus. So consumers get this purple triangle. Now for the producers, we compare what is their willingness to accept, their willingness to sell. That's given by the marginal cost curve down here. You compare that to what price they end up getting in the marketplace. So we sell the good for $75, but we had a marginal cost of say 50, then our producer surplus is 75 minus 50, which is $25. So in general, the producer surplus will be this whole blue region that's below price and above marginal cost. Now, that leaves us with this red triangle over here. That red triangle is deadweight loss. That's a measure of the inefficiency. That's because for these last couple of units, the marginal cost of making them, given by our supply curve, was less than what consumers were willing to pay. So for the goods out here, consumers want to pay, say, $60 for them, but the marginal cost of making them was just 50. So if they had agreed to a price of say 55, then both sides would have been better off. 
So, some mutually beneficial trades did not happen. Why is that? Well, the firm is intentionally trying to restrict supply so they can charge a higher price. If you supply only this many units, you can charge a big price up here. If you, if you try to produce more, like produce out here, then price goes down, it's going to cut into your profits. So, this is just a refresher on when there's no price discrimination and there is market power, then there's going to be inefficiency, there's going to be deadweight loss. It's like we were saying earlier that monopolies create deadweight loss. So that's the case when there is no price discrimination. Now let's look at when there is price discrimination. My big claim up here is that price discrimination is going to boost producer surplus and also boost social welfare. So let's see why that is true on our next slide. So that's the case over here when there is um, no price discrimination. Now let's compare when there is perfect price discrimination. Well, we said the way that works is that the firm charges to each consumer their very maximum willingness to pay. And their maximum willingness to pay is approximately given by the demand curve. So this person up here is going to pay 100, we charge them 100. So over here is going to pay 80, we charge them 80. This person is going to pay 60, we charge them 60, etc. So as a result, we said consumer surplus is going to entirely go away. But here's what happens to producer surplus. They're going to capture this entire triangle here. So for our first good, the marginal cost of making was around zero. We sold it for a price of 100. They gave us 100 if producer surplus. And then for these goods over here, the price we collected for was very high. Marginal cost of making them was very low. So we got some more producer surplus over there and so on. So that whole triangle became entirely producer surplus. Now, one thing you'll know if you compare it to our earlier diagram is that we eliminated that red deadweight loss triangle. So in our earlier story, when there was just one price for everybody, then there was inefficiency. This red triangle represented lost surplus. That's because in order to sell these consumers who are willing to buy, we have to lower our price, and lower price is going to cut into our profits, so we didn't do that. However, if we can charge everyone a different price based on their own unique willingness to pay, then we don't worry about that anymore. We can charge the high price to these guys and charge a low price to these people, and we don't have any deadweight loss anymore. So while consumer surplus vanishes entirely, social welfare nevertheless rises because producer surplus grows enormously. So perfect price discrimination is efficient, even though it's not good for consumers. So some last notes about that before I go on. So one thing to caution is that first of all, perfect price discrimination does not actually exist. We don't actually know what the consumer's maximum list of pay is. You could try serving consumers and asking them where you want to pay. However, they're not going to answer that question honestly. If you, if they know that you're going to charge them the maximum price you can get away with, they're going to tell you something different. They're going to tell you a lower price. So, if you're trying to survey this guy over here, is going to pay 100. You ask him, what's the most you want to pay? He's not going to say 100. He's going to say, I'm having a really hard time affording stuff. The very most I'm going to pay is 40. So try, so try, try to 40. Don't charge me 100. So your survey is going to be no good. They're going to lie to you, and you can't get the information directly by doing that. What you got to do instead is create a complicated financial aid form for college, and then ask them a bunch of questions and try to deduce from that and approximate what people are willing to pay. So I use college tuition as the best approximation of perfect price discrimination. Again, it's approximation, it's not really literally perfect price discrimination. 
So the question becomes, is it efficient to have college tuition be so outrageously high and to make college tuition so different for different students? I'm not quite sure about that. That's because with college tuition, it's a bit different from most other goods. You don't buy a college degree in the same way you buy a loaf of bread. We're not rationing college degrees based on price alone. If we did, it wouldn't mean anything. College degrees are rationed not just on price, but also on your actual academic skill. So if it's not just about price, it's also about your skill and your knowledge and your intelligence, then I'm not so sure this is still efficient. So that's something to think about. So again, Private price discrimination does not actually exist. If it did, it would be efficient. Um, best approximation is college tuition, but I'm not sure if this analysis really applies to college tuition because it's not all about price. So that wraps up our section on first degree price discrimination. When you come back for our next episode, we'll move on to looking at second degree price discrimination.